Uh, uh, my name is Ashok Kamath. I am with the IIT Alumni Center here in Bengaluru. Uh, most of you who are attending our webinars uh, periodically uh, are aware that we started this uh, during the pandemic and we continued this. It has been a wonderful platform to expose what is available in the various IITs and the Indian Institute of Science, uh, and of course, from industry. Uh, so there's a lot of cross-pollination in terms of ideas that have taken place since we started this. This, I believe, is our third webinar. Uh, and uh, it's our tradition that within a couple of days after the webinar is over, it's up on the IIT Alumni Center channel on YouTube for people who want to view it. Uh, uh, more than the attendees, we see on the YouTube stats that there are a lot more people who view it post the you know actual webinar uh, webcast, if you will, and uh, you know, and sometimes you see uh, a real googly is given that this is a cricket season. Uh, things that you don't expect to have multiple views. For example, mining. Uh, we were not very sure what views we would get. But it happens to be the most viewed uh, webinar in our portfolio uh, with over, I think, 1,100 views at this point. Uh, today's topic uh, is on how to build a new IIT campus, uh, the tech sustainability and so on. And I think we could not have asked for any better speaker other than the current director of IIT Tirupati, uh, Professor Satinarayana. Uh, an alumnus of IIT Madras, uh, did his PhD at Clemson, uh, came back and since 1991, he was uh, you know, a faculty member at IIT Madras and also multiple other roles. Uh, what is interesting about him is that this is not your standard app mech kind of lecture, but it has to do with construction management, something we would dearly love for you to come and tell our folks in Bangalore to clean up our mess here. <laughs> Uh, because of delays in construction. Uh, but uh, that's, I think, uh, something that he's brought to the building of IIT Tirupati, uh, the technology, its sustainability, and so on. And, you know, with his background in construction management, I think uh, it's happened time and so on and so forth. Uh, moderating this is Professor Rajiv Raj Ranjan from uh, the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, he did his master's at uh, IIT Kanpur and then a PhD from the Ministry of Science uh, teaching uh, and uh, doing his research. Uh, needless to say, both our speaker and the moderator have multiple accomplishments in terms of awards and all that. And you can easily Google them uh, and find out all of that if that's of interest. To our audience, uh, uh, we monitor the Q&A box only. We do not monitor the chat box. The chat box is for internal purposes here if we have to send messages to one another on the panel. But all the questions and need to be uh, you know, uh, entered into the Q&A box, which we will look, uh, look at periodically. Halfway through the hour, uh, uh, Professor Satyanarayana will uh, take a break and Professor Rajiv Ranjan will take questions uh, uh, from the end and then at the end at 625 uh, we will hand over to, to Dr. S my colleague Dr. do a summing up and we'll uh, we try to close at 630 uh, on the dot. Uh, with that uh, Professor Satyanarayana over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you yes. are. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, uh, so thank you uh, very much for uh, having me participate in this uh, webinar series on uh, uh, hosted by the IIT Madras Alumni Center at uh, Bangalore. Very happy to come over and last month for the inauguration of the center. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, uh, using this facility extensively. So when uh, Sushila approached me regarding uh, giving a talk, uh, 
I readily agreed because it's something that uh, we have done at IIT Tirupati, uh, and it's sort of uh, catching a lot of attention on how we built our campus in record time, and also in a very sustainable way. Uh, and even the ministry, uh, Ministry of Education, has been uh, looking at this as a model way to do it. In fact, they want me to do some training programs for uh, directors and vice chancellors and deans on how to go around planning and building campuses or, or facilities on campus on the existing brownfield campuses. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. So what you see here is a panoramic view of our campus that is being developed. I'll come to more details as we go along, but I thought initially I'll just give some background as to uh, uh, most, most of the alumni are probably aware, but if the others are watching, as to how uh, we got to uh, doing this. Uh, so, you know, we IIT system has been growing uh, since the first IIT at IIT Karakpur in 1951-52 uh, period. So, and subsequently the first five IITs uh, from uh, in Delhi, Bombay, Madras, and uh, Kanpur, uh, they were uh, by 1962-63, they were up and running. Uh, and then uh, the next IIT that started was in Guwahati in uh, 94, and uh, Roorkee became an IIT around 2002. So these, these uh, seven IITs, we call them 1G IITs, or first generation IITs. And in 2008, uh, the first major expansion of the IIT system took place given the growth of our economy, growth of our population, and the requirements uh, First of all, the aspirations of the people to study in this uh, world-class institutions and the requirement also from the country. So eight IITs were started, uh, you know, in Hyderabad and uh, uh, Indore, Gandhinagar, uh, Jodhpur, Mandi, Ropal, uh, Bhuvaneshwar, Patna, etc. And when this happened, the first major expansion, the older IITs were asked to mentor the new IITs. So, you know, there's been a mentorship model. For example, IIT Madras came forward and mentored IIT Hyderabad, uh, and IIT Karakpur mentored, uh, I think, IIT Patna and Bhuneshwar and so on. Uh, and uh, the next major expansion of the IIT system came in 2015-16. Uh, in 2014, six more IITs were announced, 2014-15. Uh, and uh, the ones in uh, in Andhra Pradesh, it was the IIT at Andhra Pradesh in uh, was part of the reorgan. Uh, you know, the state has been divided into two, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. And the part of the reorganization act says they will get an IIT, an ICER, and so on, a bunch of centrally funded institutions. Uh, so this was part of that reorganization act. But then the other states in Palakkad, in Kerala, Goa, then uh, Darwad in Karnataka, and then Bilai in Chhattisgarh, and uh, Jammu in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So these six IITs were announced in 2014, and uh, the mentor IITs were uh, identified. So IIT Madras, you know, came forward to mentor the two geographically closer IITs, one in Tirupati and Palakkad, and uh, and uh, the uh, IIT Bombay was mentored IIT uh, Goa and IIT Darwad and IIT Hyderabad mentored Bilai and uh, Delhi mentored Jammu. Uh, and IIT Madras director, then director, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy took a call that we will get started immediately uh, in 2015 itself. Uh, similarly, the state government of Andhra Pradesh also was very keen that we definitely start in 2015. But the other four IITs uh, took another year time to get their act together and get started off. So they started in 2016. So Darwad, I mean, Tirupati and Palakkad started in 2015 itself. And in between, in 2014, two more IITs, two more existing institutions were converted to IITs, so the one at IIT BHU and IIT uh, ISM Dhanbad. Uh, so the, uh, just a quick uh, historical uh, perspective. Uh, so in 2015 of, of our institute, uh, the foundation stone was laid in March of 2015, uh, March 28, 2015. Uh, you know, the then chief minister was very keen that we don't slip and don't start. So he ensured that the foundation stone is laid. And we probably had the biggest uh, foundation stone laying ceremony for any institution for that matter in the country. Uh, we had a common foundation stone program for IIT, 
ISER Tirupati. Tirupati is the only city in the country that has both an IIT and ISER. And for IIIT Sri City, uh, now IIIT Sri City is a PPP mode Sri City, so they decided to do the Foundation Stone program together for the three IITs. It was held in the site of ISER uh, Tirupati, which is just three kilometers away from our site. And we had 25,000 people in attendance. The chief minister at that time was keen to send the message that he would like Tirupati to be the major educational hub of the state. And uh, and then we had three union ministers. So it was uh, the foundation stone uh, uh, laid was laid by uh, the then uh, honorable uh, education minister, MHRD ministers, Srimati Smriti Raniji. And then we had uh, then minister for uh, urban development and parliament, uh, uh, Venkan Aidugaru and uh, the science and technology minister, uh, Sunat Chaudhary and the then chief minister and his most of his cabinet were there so so it was a lot of excitement about getting an iit in this new state and uh and it was a major function and so we launched our academic program on 5th of august you know whenever we start been starting this new iits we've been uh, the model has been that we soft launch you know it's a chicken and egg problem do we build the infrastructure and start the academic programs or you start off and then build the infrastructure so the approach uh, government has been taking is we get started off from some temporary facilities and as we go along we keep building our infrastructure so uh, so we uh, we identified uh, a particular uh, uh, a private engineering college building which we hired to get started off i will talk more about that as we go along and we started off with our btech program now the typical model that has been used in the second generation iits and even now the most on uh, the third generation iits is that we admit about 90 to 120 students. Most have been admitting 120, a few 90. And most of them started off with three branches, typically uh, computer science and engineering, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, or one branch that side of the side. Uh, but uh, Bhaskara Murthy uh, and, uh, uh, took a call that we will start with four branches in both Palakkad and Tirupati, including civil engineering. He felt that he himself is an electrical engineer, but he felt... Uh, uh, we should have civil engineering. So we started off with uh, four branches of 30 students each, uh, whereas others usually were doing three branches of 40 students each. Uh, and uh, in March, in December of uh, 2014, I was requested by the mentor director to come in as a professor in charge to get things off the ground. Uh, so I was sent to Tirupati and I started visiting Tirupati from the first week of January. Uh, to get uh, things moving in terms of identifying the temporary campus site, uh, the permanent campus site, uh, land issues, and uh, launch of the academic programs, getting the uh, faculty lined up to teach, and all those things. So we started on fifth with this uh, BTEC program in the four branches. Subsequently, uh, we added chem uh, chemical engineering in 2018. So right now we have five engineering departments uh, admitting about 240 students uh, totally. Then in 2017, we started the MS and PhD programs. Before we started the MTech programs, we started the MS programs because these programs do not have as... Uh, first thing is we had to get permanent faculty in before we could hire, uh, we could uh, start uh, research programs. So, uh, you know, I as professor in charge, I was coming in and getting things going and getting the classes going on. But uh, the regular faculty recruitment could not start till 2017 till the director was appointed. Uh, so in, in 2016, we did uh, some uh, contract. We hired about eight, nine faculty members on contract. And in 2017, January, I was appointed as a director. Uh, uh, and then we started the faculty recruitment process. And, and that's how we got permanent faculty in and started our MS and PhD programs. The first couple of years, we sent our uh, research scholars to IIT Madras for the coursework. Uh, because in MS program, they need to do about five courses, PhD program about four courses. So we got the support of IIT Madras to do that. And whenever you set up this new IIT, I, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, in, and we started our MTech programs in 2018. So we have multiple MTech programs in all the departments. Uh, and uh, and then we also started uh, uh, MSc programs in uh, math, physics, chemistry, subsequently in uh, 
uh, starting from 2019 in maths and 2020 we started in physics and chemistry and uh, last year in uh, 2022 we started a masters in public policy uh, which is get, uh, which is getting quite popular the second batch has joined this year uh, so we one thing that we set ourselves uh, 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 a target was the first batch has to live on the campus before they graduate okay uh, so so what happens what's been happening in the second generation and even now the third generation IITs is two to four batches have graduated before they ever saw the campus. So we set ourselves a target from the beginning when I was professor in charge itself that we should quickly build stuff on the, on the, the uh, in the campus and have our batch live in the campus for at least one year before they, they leave. Uh, so which we achieved, I'll, I'll come to that in uh, greater detail. Now, whenever these new IITs are set up, there is a detailed project report that is prepared uh, for the funding from the cap because the cabinet has to approve the funding and usually this DTR is prepared by an agency called EDSEL uh, for most centrally funded institutes whether it's IIT or IIMs or ISAs or triple ITs or central universities and so on. Uh, and EDSEL prepares the report and based on which uh, the, the uh, proposal is put through the cabinet and then uh, uh, you run the institute in the first uh, five to ten years depending on the institution five to in, usually they talk about seven to eight years as a project uh, because you need to do a lot of construction you need to get in a lot of equipment and so on for the first time i was asked by the ministry uh, to say it, uh, to uh, to prepare the dpr for all the six new iits uh, because I was involved in uh, at IIT Madras as the chairman of the estate, uh, so and during which time probably the most construction happened, uh, and then subsequently I was the chairman of the committee to plan and uh, ex get uh, IIM Trichy campus done, and also happened had the opportunity of uh, uh, being on committees for IIT Jodhpur campus and IIT Indore campus and so on. So, so since I had this exposure on uh, campus building. And being a civil engineer in construction management, then uh, additional secretary who subsequently became secretary, Mr. Subramaniam, said, uh, Satya, you have the knowledge and expertise in this. We are not uh, completely satisfied with Ed Sills reports. Can you prepare the DPR for all six IITs? So I was given this uh, responsibility, and then I had got that done and uh, took it through the uh, uh, Ministry of Education's Finance Department, then took it through the EFC of the Finance Ministry, and then uh, then uh, took it. Uh, then it was taken to the cabinet. So this proposal for twenty thousand three hundred crores for setting up these three IITs, uh, you know, the the uh, it was a reasonably higher amount compared to the second generation IITs because second generation IITs they missed a lot of things. So from my from our learnings on what happened there, we could and we could factor in many of things things like. Increase in prices due to escalation, uh, uh, and that different IITs have different needs. For example, in the in the DPR for the second generation IITs, the same budget was given for building, whether you're building in the desert in Jodhpur, or you're building in Hyderabad, or you're building in the Himalayas in Mandi. Everyone was given the same budget of about 380 crores initially, which is a first of all a very uh, not adequate amount. And uh, it can't be that it will cost me the same in all these places. You know, in uh, Mandi, I had to put a lot of culverts, uh, do a lot of earthwork, uh, uh, you know, through the mountains and so on. Uh, whereas uh, in other places, you know, probably don't need so much. So this fact, we brought in all these factors and uh, we were very happy that uh, the, the uh, DPR was accepted by the cabinet by very minimal uh, you know, reduction in whatever we estimated. Uh, so the campuses were supposed to build in, uh, be, uh, by, and then the DPR is for 2,500 students, okay? They say you please do a initial in the project mode, you complete a full-fledged campus for 2,500 students, and you, and you know, and IITs have one is to 10 ratio student, faculty to student ratio. Uh, so about uh, 250 faculty members requirements for their labs and offices and the housing for the faculty and the staff and the students. 
so that is the DPR. And uh, they said 2,500 students from 2017 to 2024, you need to finish this uh, uh, 2,500 student campus. But then by the time the cabinet approved everything and gave it, uh, gave the approval, it, it was November of 27. And till you, till you uh, uh, get the DPR approved by the cabinet, you cannot, you're not supposed to spend a single paisa uh, within the permanent campus uh, construction and so on. So actually they had provided for a reasonably good budget for the temporary campus operation for the first three years. That was a separate budget. The DPR is for the permanent campus. And uh, uh, so, so anyway, I'll, I'll, by the time they approved the DPR, the 2017-18 financial year was almost bag end. And then you need to appoint your uh, CPWD, you have to get your architects, you have to get all these people in. Takes another year and a half or so to complete this whole designs and tendering and so on. So there was no way we could start construction till 2019 or so. But actually, all of us really got to start constructing only in 2020. Uh, so the first three years, uh, so when we took it in the cabinet, they said, we'll fund you the first three years, take it at stage one, build a campus for about 1,200 to 1,300 students. And then you come back and we will review and give you the funding for the next four years as per the original DPR. So we have uh, gone through that process and uh, IIT Tripathi is uh, probably the only IIT which has completed the full stage one construction in all respects. Uh, and the other IITs are at different stages. Some of them are close to finishing because unfortunately IIT Goa has not got land still. Uh, so they are, have, could not start their construction. Uh, so now we are submitting the DPR for the second stage to be funded to take forward so that we finish our 2000. So we are hoping by 2026, 27, we will uh, complete the 2000 student uh, campus. Uh, so this is the pictures of the academic launch uh, uh, at, uh, in, uh, on uh, 5th of August, 2015. And one thing that we did at IIT Tripathi, which has helped us considerably, was to bring in, uh, bring in some very senior professors in the beginning. We went and got permission from the government of India to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, re-employ professors. You know, our retirement age, age in IIT is 65. So we went and uh, uh, requested and they gave permission to re-employ the professors who had retired till 70 years. So we got three professors from IIT Madras, Professor Krishnaya, who actually was uh, sort of my advisor, who started coming in from day one when I made my first visit in January of uh, 2015. He came along with me and he was with me throughout in uh, planning. Former Dean of uh, Economic Research at IIT Madras, a passionate teacher. And then we had Professor Deshmukh, uh, former HOD of Physics at IIT Madras and uh, Dean of Academics at uh, Mundi for a couple of years. And Professor Natarajan, another senior professor in physics, very passionate about taking science to uh, school children and college kids. So we had three of them. And then we had two professors from IIT Kanpur, Professor Kishore, former head of uh, mechanical at uh, uh, IIT Kanpur, and Professor Raghavendra, the very senior professor there. And subsequently, we had Professor C.P. Rao, who was a chair professor of chemistry at IIT Bombay, also come and join us. So these five professors were great help uh, to me and also to the whole institution in setting up systems. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, so bringing in the IIT culture and so on. So this has been one big advantage for IIT people. So right now we have nine departments. I have already talked about the engineering department, the three science and the humanities and social science department. The next department we're going to be starting is the material science and engineering department uh, next year. And right now we have about 100 and uh, actually it's 115 now. A couple of them joined the last week and uh, uh, faculty members in the various departments. Uh, and, uh, and we have a few adjunct professors who are uh, uh, come and teach courses and advise our colleagues. And we have two professors of practice, uh, both one in uh, the automotive sector, another one in the, uh, uh, from the defense. Uh, right now we have about 1,500 uh, plus students. Uh, and uh, so the proportion of, of uh, students, uh, undergraduate students or postgraduate students is uh, 60 to 40, 60% are undergraduate, 40%. You know, the older IITs as we go along, 
40% uh, of the students are undergraduate and 60% of postgraduate. So probably next four or five years, we will also get to that particular ratio. So right now, if you see uh, uh, out of our uh, 1,500 students, almost uh, 250 plus students are PhD students. So, so we have a very strong PhD program. And as I told you, we have a master's in public policy in addition to a lot of other uh, master's in uh, uh, the engineering areas and science areas. We have identified about uh, six uh, uh, thrust areas in terms of interdisciplinary research, looking at them from a perspective of uh, the uh, national needs, the uh, where the technologies are going, and also our local relevance in terms of where we where we are situated. So one area we have identified is manufacturing and materials. Uh, very strong push we are giving to this. We have just now set up. We have also set up a center of excellence. Uh, in uh, smart manufacturing, uh, uh, along with Siemens and uh, Wipro, uh, and uh, a lot of work going on in additive manufacturing and so on. The other one is smart infrastructure, once again with the trust for smart cities and the huge infrastructure that we are building, how do we monitor them, their performance, and so on. We have identified food technology and precision agriculture as a major, as another trust area. You know, we are in a state which has a very high uh, 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 proportion of people working in the agriculture sector and also the rice bowl of the country uh, and also their major aquaculture center. Uh, and the precision agriculture, again, from a perspective of climate change, water usage and uh, insect insecticide usage and, and so on. Uh, IIT Karakpur is the only IIT which has both a, as, a as a department of uh, agriculture, engineering and food technology. And of course, there are other IITs. Almost every IIT faculty are working in related areas, but we thought we should give it a big, strong push. Uh, and then alternative energy and storage, uh, energy storage. You know, we happen to be in a city where we have the second largest battery manufacturer in the country, uh, Amaraja. And then uh, we have colleagues who are working in the hydrogen energy area. So that's another area. The fifth area is in the area of... Uh, uh, atomic molecular and optical sciences and technologies, including quantum technologies. Between ICER and IIT, we have uh, a critical mass of young faculty members, uh, nearly uh, 10 of them working in this area. So we have formed a joint center uh, called Chemost under the guidance of our senior professor, uh, Professor Deshmukh. The area of positioning, navigation, and timing, uh, 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 the uh, uh, PNT technologies. Actually, actually, this is part of the national mission on interdisciplinary fiber, uh, cyber physical systems. Uh, we have one of the technology innovation hubs on position and precision technologies. So we are trying to create a strong startup ecosystem around this uh, technologies related to this area and also on technology development. We've been very active in sponsored research. We have had uh, about 150 plus sponsored projects, research projects to the tune of 170 crores. So for a new institute, that's a pretty good, uh, 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 you know, start in terms of um, almost all our faculty members, the, the day they come here, they start working on sponsored research projects. They've also been quite active on the consultancy front. Now, location-wise, you know, one of the big challenges any new institute uh, has is what is your access in terms of, uh, uh, you know, airport or... Uh, uh, railway station and so on. So that way, I think we are pretty well located. So this map shows you the various locations. Uh, so to the left, we have the Tirupati town all the way to the left. You what's marked as Tirupati railway station in the center of Tirupati town. And what we did is we took this temporary campus. A little, if you go a little bit to the right, if you go to the right, it's the north. Uh, where this uh, group of uh, private group of institutions called the Chadalaroda Group of Institutions, we hired one of their buildings, a large building. I'll explain the reason why we hired them, uh, which was about uh, seven kilometers from the Tupac railway station, but more importantly, closer to the Rengunda station, about three kilometers. And Rengunda junction is the big junction with about 70 express trains passing through. We have trains to uh, the Bruger to uh, the, you know Jammu to Delhi, uh, Ahmedabad, you name it, every corner, Trivandrum, Bam Bangalore. So, so we're very well connected that way. But most importantly, the Tirupati Airport is uh, is also very close. 
So our permanent campus site is actually about uh, 25 kilometers from the center of Tirupati town. Uh, yeah, about 26, 27 kilometers from the center of Tirupati town. But we are close to the airport and the Rengunta Junction. Rengunta Junction today is 14 kilometers away and the airport is about 12 kilometers. And Tirupati's uh, airport is quite well connected. We have about seven or eight flights every day to Hyderabad. We have a couple of flights to Delhi, to direct flights to uh, Mumbai, and so on. And most importantly, if you see the ICER site, permanent campus site of ICER, is about uh, three kilometers from our site. So we are in close proximity. So we're doing a lot of things together. We're taking full advantage of our uh, co-location uh, in doing things. Actually, we are closer to the temple town of Kalahasti than to the temple town of Tirupati. We are just 13 kilometers from Kalahasti. And actually, from our campus, we can see the Gopuram of Kalahasti temple. Uh, because uh, uh, we are at a higher, a little higher elevation. We are at the base of a mountain. And uh, the Gopuram, of, on a clear day, the Gopuram is very clearly visible. So that way, we are very well connected. Okay. So this is the temporary campus building that we hired. And when I went to hire this building, this was the status of the building. Okay. Actually, the ministries, the ministry uh, committee set up by MH, then MHRD to identify a building where IIT Tirupati could start off. They were identified in another engineering college called Anamachari Engineering College. It was a very nicely built building, but they said they will give us one wing of their, you know, typical, these colleges, you have a center wing and then two wings on the either side. They said they'll give us one wing. And the it, and it was very well built. And the hostels, uh, they were going to give us a few rooms in the hostel. I looked at it and I said, uh, and this has been approved by the uh, ministry. I said, this is not going to serve us for two reasons. One is the building is so tightly integrated with this private engineering college uh, uh, students and the cult, this huge cultural difference between our students and their students. You know, this private engineering college insists that you should come in full hand shirt, you should tuck your shirt, you should comb properly, you should not look at girls, uh, or, uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a very liberal, our students will show up in shorts, some of our faculty may show up in shorts, and this will create a huge cultural clash between these institutions. So I said, this is not gonna work. And the space also is, was well, you, it was not flexible enough to modify it, build, uh, change it. But this particular bill, then I asked the state government, local authorities to say, show us other options. So they showed us this building. I guess anyone else would have ran away from this place immediately. But I saw a great opportunity that this building was, uh, uh, you know, left half built. The top floor did not even have walls. Uh, it was not great, very well built also. And this college, uh, which were, they were planning to start this college, uh, this uh, management, but then uh, they uh, dropped the idea. So it gave me a few, uh, you know, full opportunity to modify it as I liked. And more importantly, this building was completely separated by the rest of the college. So there was no intermingling of our students with this private engineering college students to create this cultural clash and all those things and gave us a, a lot of our independence. So we took this building and you won't believe in two months time, we got this building the last week of May. We completely got this building done. I got an architect to redesign the, repurpose the areas for our labs, for our classrooms, for our faculty and staff rooms and so on. And put a lot of pressure on the management and got them to complete all the works. So we got, we signed the agreement with them in May, uh, last week of May, 2015. On August 5th, we started our academic program in this building. Having got adequate number of classrooms uh, ready, uh, you know, the labs ready, uh, because in the first year, you just need your physics, chemistry, and computer lab. Uh, so we got all those things done and launched our programs for this place. So this is how the building was in two months. We transformed this. Uh, we got CPWD to come. And usually CPWD said, they don't know, we're not going to come and do this. But I persuaded them to come and help us. And we completely uh, redid the building. Uh, and this is how uh, the classrooms and all this were done. And we added a dining hall later on. About a year later on, we're bringing in prefab technologies uh, for the students to have their uh, lunch and uh, snacks and other things. Now we had to get hostels. So we found this buildings, a uh, couple of buildings which were uh, set up for what they call the 21st century Gurukul 
complex and uh, uh, this was uh, that that particular program was not had not taken off and it was under the custody of sv university so the uh, local administration the collector and others alerted me these buildings are there it is under the position of sv university if you go ask them directly they may not give you need to bring pressure from the top to get it and it was 13 kilometers away from the campus right at the base of the tirumala hill right when you from these buildings you could see the buses going up to tirumala hill and all beautiful location but very secluded the nearest uh, alipiri where you start off the climb to tirumala is about it was about 4 kilometers uh, three and a half to four kilometers from there, very secluded. Uh, but uh, again, we got this whole thing uh, repaired. It was in bad shape and moved in. And then we hired a, uh, a apartment building near our campus for to house the girls. Uh, and subsequently, we had other apartment buildings uh, near our campus to hire. By the time the second batch came uh, to uh, accommodate them. And it was... Uh, uh, I was, and, and so this was the classrooms where this is the pioneer batch, the first batch of students, uh, I think in the first week of classes that were held, picture was taken. That is on the temporary campus side. And uh, that served us very well. Uh, till 2018, we had all our classes there. We would, you know, uh, to a, we had students busing in from various locations and so on. And the permanent campus, uh, site. Uh, this is the permanent campus site that we got, uh, as it looked when we when I first visited them. Uh, they I didn't. They said they're going to give us 566 acres to build this campus, and subsequently, uh, the what we finally got was 548 acres after taking into account a lot of things, availability and so on. Uh, in fact, they were trying to give us land at, uh, about a couple of kilometers away, which I refused to take and said, give me contiguous land. And that is how uh, you see between the national highway, there's a highway and the mountain, we have about 530 acres now. And on the other side of the highway, we have 19 acres. So we set aside that 19 acres for a research park. Uh, and the la it is at the base of the mountain, so it's quite undulating. Uh, but it gave an opportunity, you know, when I saw this piece of land, Again, I said, you know, we got a beautiful canvas on which we had to create a nice painting. Uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and it's, like, I can tell you that it's going to turn out to be, and this has been a big advantage of uh, giving this big, full campus view. Uh, so first thing I did, as soon as we got the land, I was still professor in charge then. Uh, uh, professor Satanarana, if you want, you can have a break for some time. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll just finish this part and then we'll take a break. Uh, so what I did is first thing I did as soon as I got the land is to commission an ecology study of the whole land. Uh, I hired this agency called Care Earth to come in and do a complete ecology study, mapping of all the flora, fauna, because the background, if you see the mountain, is a uh, is a reserve forest. So we wanted to document the water bodies, how the water was flowing, all that. So we commissioned an ecology study, which became a base document for us future uh, master plan. Yeah. So I'll stop here. Uh, very nice going. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, if there any question from the audience, we can take up at this point. Uh, I don't see something in the question and answers. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm enjoying your talk. Uh, uh, of course, I have zero experience, but very curious to ask some questions as a <laughs> cider. Means uh, something went quite well with you. Is how do you compare what what was it that you could do as compared to the I other IT directors? Uh, in a nutshell, uh, of course, I think uh, your background in this uh, engineering and the and and serving as a committee member in other ITs. Uh, was a kind of uh, uh, something which helped you. But I think this this kind of experience other people might also be having. But uh, do, can you tell us about your, in a kind of as a third person about yourself, <laughs> if you could? Yeah, so it so happens, you know, the initial years of an, any institution building is, is a lot of construction, right? And, and uh, I'm a basically a professor of construction engineering and project management. Uh, so what I teach 
what you do research in and what I was doing were all aligned. Okay. Uh, so that helped a lot, understanding contracts, understanding how CPWD works, uh, and all these aspects, uh, uh, and a lot of things that I taught in the class, which I felt the industry is not doing well, I we managed to implement on the site uh, and got the got all these people to align and uh, do it. So that's been a big advantage. Uh, yeah. I think uh, this uh, new experience for the government as well, they may start thinking on these lines for appointing new directors. <laughs> well, everyone, invariably, almost uh, everyone who visits our campus and goes, and we had a lot of ISC professors come in even recently when we had the advanced uh, materials conference and so on. So invariably, they say, we think the first director should be at the civil engineer. Yeah. <laughs> Quite natural. Other, other IIT campus that has come out very well is IIT Gauhati. Again, it was a civil engineering professor who was the director, uh, first director. Yeah. I, I see some questions popping up. Uh, one question is from Venkat Krishnan. How did you decide on the architect and the main contractor for the building IIT Tirupati? Yeah. So uh, the uh, the project, you know, basically the architect, we have appointed our own architect. We went through a uh, we advertise uh, for uh, request for services for architecture. We they came up with their proposals and so on, and we decided to keep to have two architects: one for the master plan and the economic buildings, and the other one for the uh, residential buildings, the hostels and uh, the uh, apartments for the faculty and staff. The reason is one of the reason why we decided to go with two is just we didn't want to uh, put all our eggs in the same basket with one architect if. Uh, that architect is not performing, then we are stuck. Uh, so at least, and also, I, I, this is a quite a lot of work to be done within a short period. So we thought it will be good to distribute uh, the work among two architects. Uh, so what we did is we had a, a process where we had a committee, including professors of architecture, practicing architects, uh, engineers, and so on. And uh, they came, made proposals, and then uh, we had a, you have a techno-commercial evaluation process. We give seventy percent weightage. Uh, I think I'm not sure. I'm trying to recall whether we gave seventy or eighty percent weightage for uh, the the uh, uh, presentation part of it, the technical part of it, the capability, and thirty percent for the cost. That's how we selected the architects, and the project is executed through CPWD, uh, Central Public Works Department. Now, uh, that's what, what the next question is about CPWD. I think. Uh... Venkat Krishna is from IT Mundi, and he's quite curious on this. How did you manage to get work done by CPWD yeah. or so, NBCC, especially within within time? <laughs> well, you it all again comes down to how you manage this whole process. I know everyone is struggling. Uh, uh, the thing it's not that uh, uh, again having experience working with these people on different uh, in different projects. I felt uh, CPWD was the lesser, you know, among compared to all the others. You know, one thing with CPWD is it's a deposit work. You don't pay them anything. So you don't have to, if you go to NBCC or other agencies, you have to pay some 3% to 5% of your cost. But uh, I, having seen them work in different projects and so on, I felt they're among them, they're the better options. I know CPWD system inside out. Okay, I uh, the how the contracts work and so on, and most importantly is the expectation you set right at the beginning. You know, even the CPWD people, it all depends on the team you get. So you start working right from the director general to ensure that you get the right team placed for you. Uh, good project manager, you uh, uh, good uh, good engineers. Not that everyone is going to turn out the way you want, but you need to work on that. And then make it as a strong team. Expectations are set up front. For example, safety. When I go to the construction site, I come in shoes and my head, a hard hat when I enter the site. CBW initial engineers will come in chapels or something like that. I used to throw them out of the site. So that professionalism was set right up front between us, the CPWD and the contractor people, everyone. Uh, and everyone quickly aligned. Even they, when they see that you're serious about this whole thing, you know what you're talking about. They fall in line and uh, they're also excited that uh, they are getting so much recognition for the project they are uh, doing. 
so uh, so i know everyone has a huge challenge dealing with cpwd and bcc all these people but uh, in fact next week we are having a big party with all among all of us to celebrate the closure of our project and everyone is a strong team building that teamwork up front setting the expectations right i think is very important right thank you there is one more question uh, this is from indra vijay singh uh, he writes uh, today 50% iit students opt for non technical option as career graduation from iits i don't know what he means really but okay i i i no i know what he means but i think that is little bit beyond the scope of this presentation maybe that's mm -hmm. thing we can discuss separately that's a another issue that i've been passionately talking about with the, uh, all the acit or uh, all the industry people but i think that's not the focus of today's uh, uh, webinar so uh, i think we'll pass that question yes sure uh, i think uh, fine i think uh, from my side the cpwd being a government organization do you face like uh, i mean isc and we have seen several buildings coming up in the last so many years and after some time they develop cracks so we always have this concern about the quality uh, is how uh, does this concern you or from well definitely so it's nothing it's well it's not necessarily because cpwd executed is uh, the same because there are whole bunch of reasons why this could happen it depends on your design if your design is faulty you could have cracks it depends on the you may have the best of the system but the contractor is not a good contractor you could have problems right supervisor job is to do the supervision and get the project delivered for you uh, get the right uh, see, a lot of people uh, don't understand that the uh, final execution is done by a contractor it's not supervisor supervisor is an is a is your agent to get work done they your uh, uh, we call construction project management uh, agency uh, P pmc professional construction management agency so they are uh, prob in many places pro yes they are some quite uh, not professional in terms of uh, but on the whole i find that they are reasonably okay uh, and uh, and uh, but you need to push them you need to get, get things done through them yeah thank you Yeah. Uh, so shall we yeah. continue so that yeah, uh, let us continue. Yeah. Uh, so okay. Uh, so we did this complete uh, uh, eco ecological study of the campus. We mapped it. We have all the flora fauna. We have about two hundred. When we did the study, we identified about two seven one seventy bird species visiting, visiting our campus. and then subsequently we keep doing along with the riser friends we have a couple of ecologists there bird watching and all that we have now documented about 213 bird species visiting our campus and different kinds of uh, flora fauna and most importantly you know the route the water takes when it rains not that it rains too much in tirupati but whenever it rains uh, the the what we call the swales uh, or the rivulets we retain all their roots as it is as per the natural drain and did all the building plans around that uh so we decided to do a master plan for 12000 students now why 12000 students if you see the first generation iits now they are at about that number uh after uh, being in existence for 60 plus years uh, they've reached about 12000 students but more more important there's a kakodkar committee report which said iits should grow to be About twelve thousand students. That is a report that given a few years back, and that's what the second generation ITs. I mean, first generation ITs have got to. So we did our full master plan for the twelve uh, thousand students, and as but we are, however, we are building a full campus under this project mode for two thousand five hundred students. So this is the master plan. We divided the campus into uh, multiple zones. Uh, this is the master plan that we did. how we are going to grow over 12000 for 12 to 12000 students maybe over next 30 40 years uh so now that's a big uh, issue uh, you know the first generation it is took about 60 plus years to get there i kept telling that we with the current uh, you know uh, learnings that we have and uh, the comfortable financial situation in the country is we probably can get there in 30 40 years but now i have a new chairman mr sajan jindal he is uh, and he says we should get there in another within 10 15 years so that's a debate i'm having with him uh, but what we did 
is in one corner of the site, we did we developed about 35 acres very fast uh, to set up this, uh, what we call the South Campus now. We used to call it the Transit Campus within the permanent campus site. Two things, the DPR was not approved by then and I was not even, I was not the director still at that time. But I said we should go ahead and start all this construction process and all that. And uh, in 35 acres in one corner, I went and convinced the government. They said, unless the DPR is approved, you cannot put a single paisa in permanent campus. But they put about, gave us about 90 crores for the first three years in the temporary campus. So I went and convinced the uh, secretary then and additional secretary saying, I don't want to, and they had, I don't want to put money in the temporary campus uh, where we are uh, working. Let me put the money in the permanent campus. And uh, they they came back. Finally, they said, okay, as long as you're within that 90 crores for capital for your equipment and that, you can go ahead. So I had to go and convince them and get that uh, sanction done. So we could start off fast because we did that. Uh, and uh, we quickly built up uh, capacity for about 800 students' hostels. We brought in a lot of new technologies. We brought in prefab technologies and set up undergraduate uh, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering labs, all those things. We finished by 2018, these buildings were ready. So that part, including the sports facilities and all that, we did in one corner. As you see the map, the right side is north, the south side is west. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the left side is uh, south, and the top where the mountain is, is west. Okay, uh, So in the southwest corner, to not affect the master plan because master plan was not started by then. Uh, we built built up this in 35 acres. I hired an architect, got it designed, got the contract done. And uh, we we very and we tried a number of new technologies. My stand has been that if we as an institute of uh, technology, uh, if we don't demonstrate technologies in our site, because uh, typically CPWD and all these people, unless it is there, they're in their manuals and they're in their specifications, they are unwilling to do, but I had to go convince them and make them uh, saying, I take the risk of all the technology uh, and I'm putting my head on the block and uh, you do it. And uh, and also I found out that some of them are alumni. So you get those guys to come and uh, work with you. Uh, and that's how we could do all these things. Okay, then we we had the academic zone uh, we, uh, where we are, all the academic buildings are expected to come. Then we had the hostel zone on the uh, north uh, west corner, and then the residential zone on the uh, south uh, west corner. Okay, we put the school right out at one corner. Uh, one of the biggest challenges the old IITs have is many of them build schools right in the middle of the campus. In IIT Madras, at nine o'clock in the morning, there's a huge traffic of outsiders because the ninety percent of the kids studying in this KV or in one one school there or from outside. Uh, and then at 3 o'clock, between 3 and 4, again, there's a huge traffic of all these uh, kids uh, go, going out, their parents coming, picking them up, so on. So we put it right one corner so that people can, don't have to enter the campus to get to the school. So a lot of these learning experiences from the older IITs. Uh, whatever you see in uh, yellow was built in two, by 2018. Whatever you see in white is just been completed. Uh, uh, and then on the other side of the road, we had 19 acres. So we set that aside for a research park. Uh, if you see at the bottom of the screen, and we are connecting the, the two passes of land with an underpass. We got the permission of an NHAI. We're giving it as a deposit work them, to them to do it. In IIT Madras Research Park, as all of you know, we have the biggest uh, academic research park in over 12 point some acres. And I was involved again with Ashok Dinwala. I was the chairman of the committee to build the research park there. So again, other experience of uh, building a, uh, a major uh, facility. So, so the moment I saw this 19 acres there, we set it aside for a research park. So this is the campus that we fill, finished in 2018 itself, that is within the three years of the institute starting and moved all the students in, in 2018. So the background of the hostels, at the front of the labs, we brought in this, we used the steel uh, thing, and then some multi-purpose building, dining hall, all this. Uh, and uh, it's come out really nice. Uh, and we brought a number of technologies. The hostels were built with glass fiber reinforced gypsum panel technology, which IIT Metras has promoted. I will talk about some of these technologies we used. Uh, and this was the sports facilities we created then. We have a beautiful indoor stadium with uh, three shuttle courts, gym, all this. All this were operational, uh, tennis courts, volleyball courts, uh, track, uh, 
and uh, football and so on. Uh, so, and now coming, so that was what we call stage 1A and 1B campus. But the big, and that was about uh, about 80 crores or so we spent for those uh, that part of, part of the campus. Once the DPR was approved, we did the planning, we did the, uh, we got the architects in, we finished all the designs and so on. Uh, we started the, what we call the main campus construction. We call it the stage 1C construction. And this is about 700 crores construction. Uh, and what you see here are some pictures of the uh, entrance to the building and so on. So this is the main entrance to the building that we built. Uh, all of buildings you see here uh, in the academic area are all what we call the fair face concrete buildings. There's no plastic, there's no plastering, no painting. Okay, so you have to build very precisely. You have to build it with very good quality. You have no room for error. Uh, you can't have honeycombing, you can't have things deviating, you know, you have to use millimeter precision and so on. Uh, so so this, this is the main entrance to the campus. And then uh, this is the panoramic view. So what you see here, as you enter the campus, we have two large lakes. The two lakes together are over 10 acres uh, and, uh, and about 14, 12 feet deep. So we can store 80 million liters of water. So the runoff from the mountain and our campus, whenever we have rain, we store it there. It's a very good quality water, almost crystal clear. It takes care of when we become a 2,500 student campus with all the full thing, it takes care of more than four months of our, our water supply. So we're not, we are, we are capturing water, uh, rain harvesting it and uh, taking care of it. Uh, and then you see the, uh, we, in, the, in this stage, we built five academic buildings. Uh, the administrative building, as you see in the front, uh, then the uh, two, uh, what we call academic building one and two, which houses the various departments, a large central instrumentation facility, and a lecture hall complex. So, so this is all fully done, occupied, under use. And then we built, uh, if you see on the left side, we built housing there, about 168 apartments, then we have a guest house, and director's house, and then we built you know, in the in the South Campus, we already had 800 plus uh, student capacity hostels. We built another thousand uh, student hostels. I'll I'll come to each of these buildings very soon. So as you enter, you have two beautiful lakes. We created nice parks there, and then you get to this building. Uh, and as usual, everyone has a problem. You'll see suddenly in the middle, right in the middle of the campus, you see that green patch behind the academic building, 2.8 acres belonging belonging to a farmer who is refused to vacate and continues to refuse to vacate. He's got a court order saying that we cannot uh, uh, interfere in his cultivation. So he continues to cult come and cultivate his crop. Anyway, we're waiting. The, so you're, once it's in the court, you don't know when it will get resolved. So this is the administrative building uh, uh, as you uh, where uh, all our administrators sit. My office is also at the top floor there. And this is another view of the administrative building. So as you enter, suddenly you have a big uh, opening and when you get close, you will suddenly see this mountain open up, uh, mountain top opening up in front of you. Uh, then these are the academic buildings. This particular building has, uh, you will see all of them are fair face concrete, no painting, no plaster. Uh, and uh, uh, this building houses uh, on the ground floor library in one side and the other side data center and computer center and also in the river, river in the rear. And then we have electrical, mechan electrical computer, computer science, engineering, mathematics, and uh, humanities here. Because these are the departments that don't have heavy labs. So we don't have to provide too many services and, uh, and so on. So the, the faculty and the labs associated with the department are here. Now, this building is uh, what we call academic building two, which has uh, departments that need uh, yeah, wet labs, heavy labs, civil engineering, uh, chemical, chemistry, they're all housed in this. Between these two buildings, we have about uh, 50 labs. A, a typical lab is nine meters by nine meters. A lot of things have been standardized, both from planning perspective and also from the perspective of uh, 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 construction, ease, ease of construction. We've built a huge, now actually these are all, the, these, these two views of the river, river, reverse of the building, a rear, rear view of the building. We built a large instrumentation facility, 85,000 square feet central instrumentation facility, which house, which will uh, house, you know, on the ground floor, we took care, we built uh, very high roofs to house large, uh, uh, tomorrow if you had to bring in Titan electron microscopes and so on. 
a lot of lessons again that we learned from uh, in the struggles that the first generation IITs have had in retrofitting their buildings to accommodate this high-end equipment, we incorporated all those things, including the services and all that. This is a lecture hall complex, which has about 30 classrooms, different sizes. We have 30, we have 240-seater, then four 120-seaters, multiple 40-seaters, 60-seaters. Top floor, we have undergraduate physics lab, we have chemistry lab in this particular building. Uh, so this is a huge lecture hall complex. And these are the hostels, two hostels. Uh, each uh, having uh, which accommodating 500 single rooms, so 1,000 rooms between the two. And then we already we built a central dining facility, which will take care of the next stage also. And if you see right at the top, at the base of the mountain, you see two tanks. And that is where our water tank is, from where water supply is supplied. That is the highest point of the campus. There's a difference of elevation of 70 meters between the rear of the campus and the front of the campus. That's about 230 to 40 feet. So instead of building a huge water tank in the middle of the campus, we used the uh, gradient to uh, take advantage of it and put it there so that by gravity, water is fed. And we did, again, in the hostels also, we had a lot of interesting features so that the students' cloth drying is not coming out and so on. So this is a close, uh, closer view of the uh, hostels. These are the housing that we built, 168 apartments uh, uh, for various uh, faculty and staff. So this is the housing. Uh, this is the central circle. Uh, this is a guest house. We, we have a 20 room guest house right now. Uh, and these are the ponds that we created uh, for the other thing. And then our water supply is coming from, uh, from uh, Telugu Ganga project. You know, the so what we did is when we had to get the water uh, supply, uh, I started talking to the state government and then they said they'll supply from Telugu. Then I said, create a scheme for both IIT and ISA together because we're close by. And that's how they created the scheme. So it's about from 25 kilometers away, there's a pipeline uh, which we tap the water from the Telugu Ganga and comes to a summer storage tank about seven kilometers from a campus. From there, it's distributed to IIT and ISA. But we are trying to see you know, we're trying to optimize uh, how we, uh, depending on when it rains here, uh, how do we minimize our dependent on this water and maximum try to capture it within our campus. Okay, so we have brought in, as I told you, one of the top point I was making is about various sustainable technologies we brought in. The hostels that we built in the first uh, first stage, stage 1A in that south campus, we used glass fiber reinforced some panel technology. And then we had polished concrete floorings, we had uh, 48 old DC fittings and so on. So this is the architect's rendering of the South Campus as before we started it. And when you see how it is completed, it almost looks the same. Uh, so we brought in this glass fiber reinforced gypsum panel technology to build our hostels. We built it with a waste product. Gypsum is a waste product from chemical and fertilizer industry. We used that to build the uh, our buildings. Uh, these panels are made in a factory 12 meters by three meters, uh, hollow core. Uh, the technology for making the panels is from Australia, from a company called Rapid Wall. So uh, then the design is done by the architect, including where the openings are, uh, door openings, and the sizes of the panels. A CAD uh, model is fed into the, uh, uh, at the, at the uh, manufacturing facility. So this one was made at the FACT factory in Cochin because they have 7 million tons of gypsum lying there. They don't know what to do it. So all our hostels in that stage, uh, in our South Campus are built with this technology where we use a waste product to build the thing, not a single brick, connect. 30% savings, 30 to 40% savings in cement, 20% savings in cost, but it has to be built to two millimeter precision. It's cut in the factory to two millimeter precision, executed in the site to two millimeter precision, we civil engineers, the way we execute it, at least in India, on the side, one inch, two inch, that side, the side is fine. Finally, you have plaster, you put plaster and make everything look okay. Now you don't have, but here I have to do it. At, so I did a very specialized contractor who will do it to that level of precision, who understands this. You need an architect who knows how to optimize the sizing of the panels, because if you do, if you do your rooms and other things and you could cut too much, because it's made in 12 by 8 by 3 meters panels. So you want to minimize your wastage of panels. 
so we had an we identified an architect who knew how to do this. We identified a subcontractor who specializes in this. We identified a major contractor. Uh, a couple of them said, uh, why did you tie up with these subcontractors and tender for the job? So we did a lot of homework to get it done. Otherwise, you don't get the right contractor. Uh, it is, uh, it, this will turn out to be a disaster. So this is something that I was also involved with my colleagues, Meher Prasad and Devdas Menon at IIT Madras in taking this technology, implementing it. The Australians, when they designed this, they were looking at this as only an infill wall or maybe ground plus one story. But IIT Madras, we had come up with a design methodology to take it to eight stories. So this is the biggest GS of a GFRG project in the country that has been executed. Uh, again, a lot of risk we had to take because if it fails, you know, in the government system, if something fails, uh, who is uh, who are we going to, uh, you know, dock or uh, make accountable? So this is a, this is just an uh, how we brought in this use this gypsum, which is a waste product, and then it's made in the factories. Uh, sorry, this slide is repeat. The re, in the the innovation item and trust team brought in. We use the same panels for formwork for the flooring also. In addition to walls. Uh, so basically what you do is you cut grooves and then you put uh, reinforcement in it because this is a hollow, hollow coat and then you put a screed on the top. So these are all the innovations IIT Madras uh, team came uh, brought forward and then we implemented this so I, because I knew I was going to get full support from my colleagues at IIT Madras. We also made this, use this for staircase. So I don't need form work now to build this because the uh, flooring material itself uh, is is uh, is this panels, so you save on formwork and all these things. Uh, so a lot of advantages. Uh, you get more carpet area. The thickness of the uh, the panel is only five inches. Uh, you know our, no our normal walls are, are nine inches. So you get more carpet area. Uh, you save all those things. Uh, essentially using the waste material. Uh, so a lot of if you look at it from a sustainability perspective, a lot of advantages. But there's a challenge with technology. You know, you need the right contractors who can execute it, which is not a problem. Unfortunately, this technology had so much potential, but the company that was manufacturing it has gone because of financial uh, mismanagement and all that, it's gone bankrupt. So these panels are not available. I have, I have so many people who come visit our site to look at it and they, they want to do it, but it's a supply chain issue now. Okay, then we brought in polished concrete. You know, when you put tiles, uh, if I'm using, say, granite or I'm using Shabbat stone or uh, whatever, I'm dis I'm either uh, blasting a mountain or destroying a mountain or quarrying a place. So, uh, or if I'm using uh, the manufactured tiles, whether it is uh, vitreous or uh, uh, ceramic tiles, a lot of embodied energy goes into making them. So this, this we so I came across this technology which I've seen used across a lot of campuses abroad is a polished concrete where you polish concrete to mirror finish, uh, where you use uh, uh, diamond cutting, diamond abrasive uh, machines, and then you impregnate it with some toughness, uh, and then identified this contractor ACT Advanced Con I, his alumnus White Madras uh, Mohan uh, Mohan Ramnathan, uh, so worked with him with the specifications. And you polish the concrete to mirror finish with high uh, with a high strength, so you get and use laser screeds for leveling it, so you, and jointless. Of course, you get some small cracks, and I've studied this extensively. Wherever I go, I look at this. Uh, we have we have managed to get lesser cracks than what I've seen Americans or the Europeans have uh, got. So you can see the finish of the reflection of the guy on the flooring. So works great in labs because these tiles in labs and other things break often. So these were some of the labs that we set up. You can see the flooring system uh, that we have. So uh, there are many advantages to this uh, flooring system. Once again, uh, it looks like it will slip, but it's not. It is slip resistant, uh, uh, skid proof. And then we brought in 48 volt DC fittings into our hostels. Again, this is all in our uh, uh, south campus. You know, Ashok Jonjalwar and his team have been pushing this 48 DC uh, because you get about 30% energy savings. Uh, you know, when you generate solar power, uh, you power uh, power from uh, solar, uh, then it comes to DC, then you put inverters, convert to AC, and then uh, again, a lot of our appliances today are uh, DC, again, you convert it to DC, 
whether it's computers or a lot of electronics or LEDs. So why don't you use DC directly? And we implemented this in all the hostels. We have 48 volt lights, fans, uh, you know, brushless uh, technology. Now, once again, that's this technology again has a supply chain issues. We managed to work with this thing, but are they freely available? Not really. So, uh, but uh, but again, uh, these are the challenges when you put in new technologies. And then we put in this on the right side lab. If you see, you see this big fans, what we call HVLS fans, high volume, low speed fans. So all our labs, you know, South Campus, wherever we have high ceiling, have only one fan in the whole room. I'm just giving an example of a dining hall. Uh, similarly, in all our dining halls, we have put this. So no noise, beautiful breeze uh, you get. Uh, I was just from another IIT's uh, hostel. We, you can see the number of fans that they have to put there. So you get so much noise, you get only air below the fan. And these have worked great. Colleagues who have been visiting us from various institutions see this. And I know in IIT Madras, at least, they've gone back and implemented this in some of the buildings after seeing what we have done here. We have two STP plants. We are recycling water. We recycle water for, uh, we have two, two, two pipeline system in all our buildings, whether it's academic buildings, residential buildings, one for flushing, one for uh, drinking and uh, bathing and other purposes. So we recycle the water. We use recycled water for gardening and we use it for running our AC plant. By the way, we have a district cooling system. Uh, so we have a 1,800 tons uh, centralized AC plant which supplies AC for uh, cold water to all the five academic buildings. Uh, so we don't have AC units sitting on individual buildings. Uh, so from a central plant, uh, the district cooling system, uh, we have the AC system. On all our classrooms, all our everything is air conditioned. Another technology we have tried is pervious concrete. Uh, that is water goes through concrete to recharge. So one of my colleagues specializes or does research in this area, works in the we've done test test sections in the campus to demonstrate this technology. Uh, uh, so water goes through and uh, recharges. Otherwise, what happens in our regular roads, water runs off very fast uh, and uh, you, you can have flooding. And so there are a lot of benefits from this. Demonstrated 3D technology, 3D concrete technology. Our bus stands are made with 3D concrete. You can see the complicated shapes uh, that you could get because of 3D concrete printing. So this company, Thwasta, which is a startup from IIT Madras, uh, we worked with them, got these things designed. And, uh, and as a demonstration, once again, two of the bus stops and then asked our contractor to execute it in lieu of the regular bus stops that we did. For the same cost, of course, it, maybe he had to spend a couple of lakhs more. That's all, and and uh, brought in three D printed concrete uh, technology into the campus in the construction. You know, one day I was going for my walk, and suddenly I see the uh, swale or the rivulet lining, and also my lake lining. They were putting these granite stones. They were unloading from trucks granite stones. I said, stop, why are you guys using these granite stones? And I, they said, this is the specifications. You have to put in the stones, which are 22.5 centimeters size on the average. It has to be dressed and put there. But then I said, we our whole site is full of the stone. You know, the stones that you see on the right side, the, if you excavate our site, it's mostly stone with a little soil in it. And as per the contract, the contractor is supposed to take the stone and throw it out and get, I mean, get uh, rid of it appropriately, uh, and it's a big challenge. Who's going to take stone? Anyone will take soil. So I said, this doesn't make sense. But then, then this, this is our standard CPW specifications. But then I said, I asked them, where are you getting the granite from? They said, we're blasting a mountain about 40 kilometers away, getting it rust there, putting it in trucks and bringing it here. So I said, you're polluting all along. Uh, your uh, you know, whole mountain is being removed. And uh, this stone here, you're taking through nothing to use this stone. But they said, we cannot because this is this, these stones don't match our specifications. And uh, But then I said, do it. But then they said, if we do it, now there'll be allegations, people saying that you change the specifications to benefit the contractor. Okay. Uh, and uh, for, there will be technical audits. And then they will say you have benefited and there'll be committees, uh, inquiries saying contractors benefited, that's why you change the specification. Then I said, nothing doing, I, I cannot accept this argument. Uh, then they said, if the contractor gives a discount of say, uh, re reasonable discount, maybe we can then easily justify it. 
then I had to talk to the contractor. But the contractor, for a contractor, any change is an opportunity to make money. I teach contracts, so I know. I teach them how to do this. So, so I had to call the contractor and tell them, uh, look here, you need to give a discount. They said, no, no. There, I just place an order. The stone comes, I just place it. Here, I have to go around the site. I have to employ a whole bunch of 30, 40 people who need to sort the stone, get the right size. I have to have a big exercise going on. It's going to actually cost me more. At best, I'll give it to you at the same cost. I said, this is not going to work. We're we are talking about environmental damage. I take the risk. Again, I gave them an order that uh, you have to do it this way. Give me a discount. And one of the vice presidents would, would keep sending us every day morning. We have a WhatsApp group to follow, to track the projects about Sadhguru's messages, about uh, ecology, sustainability. I said, no point sending this message. You show it on the ground. So finally, they gave about 20% discount and we could get it executed. Uh, actually, it looks better also than the granite. And and uh, uh, now we did fair face concrete, not easy to achieve, especially at such heights uh, because we do large panels. We took three months of trial and error to get the, we have to use self compacted concrete, formwork specifications. The whole thing depends on how well you specify. There are a number of campuses where fair face concrete has been done recently, uh, Gandhinagar and uh, Hyderabad and a number of others. But I think we got much better quality than them because of the lot of effort that we put in in, in specifying the formwork. The formwork is now uh, Doka, I mean, Perry formwork from Germany. All that depends. And then self compacting concrete took us three months of working with various trials of mixes and other things. Got my colleagues from IT Madras who specialize in self compacting concrete. You have to look at the compatibility between the formwork and the concrete. You see on the left side some marks, patches. That's because somehow the the, the uh, fluid that they were using for uh, deep shuttering was leaving impressions, so we had to change all these things. And then uh, finally, we kept trying till we got this kind of finish, and then we let them use the appropriate mix and the combination. So this is the uh, you know the formwork. If you see them, large formworks. We don't let more than two millimeter deviation in how it is built. You see the thin panels. And the uh, the way formwork is assembled at the site, uh, it's all very engineered. Uh, very large panels. The whole pour is done in one pour, uh, about uh, 40 meters length, about 3.8 meters height. Uh, and you can't put a vibrator in because it's huge reinforcement. These are shear walls. So you had to use self-compacting concrete uh, that will flow on its own. So a lot of engineering had to go into the mix design of the mix itself so it flows and compacts itself. So this is the formwork that we use. The other thing is we did a model. We said, I told my contractor and uh, the thing, we need to take care of our workers. 95% of my workers are migrant workers coming from Jharkhand, Bihar, uh, Orissa, all these places. We created a, a model colony for these workers to work. So first thing I told them is we need to give dignity of labor. Even how you name this colony, they used to call labor's colony, they used to call workers' commute, and so on. I said, no, even how you name it. So I gave them two days time to go come up with an appropriate name. They came back, call it Viswakarma Avas. We had 2,200 workers at peak time. We supplied our own drinking water to all of them. You go look at the toilets, pick and span. We had a, a sewage treatment plant within that, and they were recycling that. They were creating biogas was being supplied to the workers. They had a health center. We had a school for the children uh, and uh, uh, and a very nice shop, big shop for them to work. Created two parks for them to relax in the evening. Uh, then there's a small temple. So all this was done. So, uh, and we were very strict on safety. You know, there is a safety. If you see here, we have had 18.3 million man hours of incident-free construction in this project when we completed it. Uh, and with uh, uh, and every worker who came in had to go through a one day safety training, very strict PPE requirements, hard hats, shoes. I will not and I would not enter any site without my hard hat and shoe to send a message that uh, because unless if you do it, how can you ask the lowest way to do it? Uh, so they had biogas uh, supply and all those things. We won about 17 awards for our campus, two for sustainability, 10 for health and safety and four for our construction uh, that we have done. 
We got the Griha Award. We got the Hadko Award for Sustainability. We got 10 awards, including the British Safety Award, uh, the CIA Award for the best site in the country, the National Safety Council Award for the best site in the country. Uh, almost every possible award in the safety thing, we have received it for taking care of the health. Uh, so these are some of the awards. We got the best sites, Construction Industry Development Council, which is an arm of uh, erstwhile planning commission, now the TIO, they, they give away every year, they identify four or five sites in the country, give them the best site, uh, best construction site in the award. 2023, we got the award for the best construction site in the country. Uh, so like to acknowledge uh, the support that we've received, excellent support from the ministry. You know, we did not have to struggle even one day for lack of funds. They saw a project going so well, so they would go out of the way to ensure that things go smoothly. I think they, they see commitment, they see uh, things happening. I think people would like to support it, as long as you're within budgets and within the same. Government of Andhra Pradesh, once again, they gave us all the land and wherever support. Our mentor institute, IIT, has always been there. Whenever we made, uh, need, they've been there. Our architects, uh, Suresh Goel and Associate and Radha Shila, CPWD, again, as I told you, has done a fun, excellent work here. And the most importantly, the uh, support of our faculty, staff, and students. I'll just close it finally with the uh, uh, thing that we awarded our tender on March 28, 2020 for this particular thing. And James, I missed the most important uh, in the slide, uh, our, our contractor who did an excellent job. Sorry, I have to apologize to them. They... Uh, GMC projects, it's called Kalpataru now. They did a fantastic job. June, March 20th, 20, uh, 20, we award the tender. 24th is the lockdown. Okay. And uh, so we could not do anything. June 2nd or 3rd was the Unlock 1.0. Our contractor started mobilizing his workers from hiring buses, bringing them. You know, there were certain districts with lockdown, certain districts without lockdown. I had to pick up the phone and call the collector saying, Please let them through to come in. Most importantly, we, we uh, the workers, we kept them very far away from the rest of the community, that call-in that we created. And we finished our project in spite of working through the uh, pandemic, just nine months behind schedule. Uh, so thank you very much. For the, yeah. Thank you, Professor Satnarayana, for the very fascinating and very stimulating and very inspiring talk. I think... Uh, Whosoever has listened to your talk must have felt inspired that how uh, when you are, your heart is there and, uh, and you have experiences there, how fantastic things can be achieved, even within the government framework. Thank you very much for your very, very inspiring talk. Thank you. Uh, I will take up some questions, which is there in the box. Uh, one question is from Mr. Uh, Ganeshan. His question is, any exchange program envisaged from overseas reputed institutions? Yes, we are working with a number of institutions uh, uh, across the world, uh, including from Canada, US, and uh, 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 you know, even Japan and these countries. So we have MOUs that we've worked out and uh, uh, and we are actually collaborating. In the first few years, we have went a little slow on this. Now, we are quite aggressively doing this. Yes, we have a number of them here that we're working out here. In fact, there were a bunch of Stanford students in our campus last month, about 20 of them. The next question is from N. Raghavan. This question is, is there any plan to develop master SOP for setting up large educational institution now, based on the experience with all the IITs. Yes, in fact, uh, the secretary, Mr. Sanjay Murthy, has been asking me to do this. In, in uh, uh, We just completed a template for any new... Uh, uh, he wants me to create a cell in IIT Tirupati. So any Ministry of Education uh, centrally funded institution building, he says your, the cell that uh, you set up has to clear it from a, from a fund, funding perspective. He says if the cell clears, we'll fund it in terms of the, within the parameters that the ministry has set. So uh, I said, how much can I do? Uh, uh, I need another to build the, what we built is right now is half. As I told you, the first stage we completed, we will be building as much. Uh, so this first stage was about 800 crores. 
we will be building about 1,200 crores worth of uh, construction further in the next stage. So, uh, so yes, we are working on that. Ministry has been asked me to do that. They've been asked me to run some workshops for the people. And, uh, and we just, uh, so I submitted the report for the templates to uh, assist other institutions in doing this just uh, four days back. Uh, and I'm supposed to go next week and do some training for it and so on. I guess this question is from my friend NRG and Raghavan. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Sri Kumar has asked what green building certificate are obtained already and what are planned for the future? Yeah, so we have, uh, we are, uh, you know, now we, we are using the Griha certification process and uh, we are sort of definitely in uh, uh, four, Griha four. Uh, Griha five, we have the borderline and uh, uh, it is under evaluation now. So, uh, so probably we may achieve Griha five, but Griha four, we are surely getting it. Thank you. Um, Professor Prasad has asked, are there any AI techniques implemented in the building? Well, AI techniques, not really. Uh, uh, if you're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, uh -huh. not really. Uh, we have, uh, we have implemented a number of, uh, uh, you know, we have used BIM for modeling our building information modeling system. We have worked with a drone company, for example, a company that uses drones to come and do measurements and so all that. We are doing it more at a research level uh, and uh, so on, but directly as an AI application, not really. Uh, there is a congratulatory message from Sunil Karna. Very impressive work, live example for all on sustainable construction. Yeah, quite right. Uh, he has also asked a question. Could you manage to get a good company for the PEB around Tirupati as transportation of PEB blocks is a challenge? No, because, uh, you know, this uh, PEB he's talking about is uh, if it is for the GFRG building, glass fiber reinforced gypsum panel building, there were only two companies in India that were making it. One was Rusty Chemicals in Bombay. The other one was FACT. But Rusty Chemicals stopped long back and FACT is about 700 kilometers away, and uh, we were getting it from them. Uh, uh, so that is the availability. But even FACT, the banks have shut them down because of they ran into some financial problems. So those panels are no more available. In fact, our our we were working the IT Midras team. Uh, we were working on trying to get many of these things set up at different parts of the country, especially from a transportation perspective. He has a point there the cost of the transportation. Uh, but somehow this technology has not uh, survived in India. Though it's a great technology, great sustainable technology. Uh, there's one question from uh, Mallikarjuna. He has asked, sir, with high flow speed fans, if they are down, whole ventilation will be down and repairing them is so difficult because of height. Yeah, so he's talking about HVLS, the HVLS fans, high volume, mm -hmm. low speed fans. Uh, we have had now, as I told you, we finished our uh, stage 1A campus in 2018 when we put in these fans there. So now we are five years. Uh, we have had occasional uh, repair uh, occasionally to be done, but it's not been that much of a challenge. Uh, yeah, you know, you need to, when I have so many of these things, I need to have my scissor lifts or my other arrangements, platform arrangements to get to the fans. Uh, so even for cleaning the buildings and all that, we need this access uh, facilities. So we are putting those things in place. Uh, one question is from Sanjeev Sabarwal. He has asked, have you used passive solar design? Not really. We are not used to passive solar design. Uh, actually, if you see, uh, all our buildings, uh, you see, you see those red slats that we've used to cut down the heat uh, into the buildings. The buildings are appropriately. All of them, you'll see, are perfectly oriented from a, uh, you know, the uh, the sun uh, direction perspective. But uh, we have not done that. But all our buildings are uh, solar rooftop enabled, and uh, so in the stage one A campus, we put in about two thirty kilowatt uh, solar. Uh, panels. Now we are putting another uh, nearly one megawatt uh, 
uh, but in stage two, we plan to do a complete uh, uh, solar uh, implementation. Uh, so right now we are having about one megawatt solar generation uh, that's going to happen. Uh, but uh, the passive thing now we think when we do the stage two buildings, uh, uh, we are looking at some of those options. Okay, I'll take up the last question. Some are there, but I think this is interesting. This is, I think, is coming from experience of somebody. Uh, Sintil Kumar has asked, what is your opinion on the current standard contract practices, clauses, procurement methods on controlling the contractor's performance on the successful delivery project with these advanced technologies that you have used? So that is the biggest challenge. Yeah. That is the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, the, the, the lot of technologies which are good if uh, they fail uh, in terms of getting ad uh, adopted because you get a wrong contractor to execute it and they do such a bad job of it, the con technology gets a bad name. And uh, selecting the right contractor is always a challenge uh, with the government uh, processes. But if you know the whole process, there are ways to handle this. Uh, for example, uh, what I did on this project, and which I did when I was also the chairman for the Jodhpur, IIT Jodhpur Contractor Selection Committee, is to put a committee to go and visit the sites of all prospective contractors, uh, uh, then look at the quality, assess the quality, and give a quality rating. Now, what I found is CPWD has this uh, grade A contractor, grade uh, A, B, C contractor, one, two, three contractor, and they say if they are qualified, you have to give the work to them. But then I found that it is valid up to 500 crores. So if it is more than 500 crores, uh, so it, because our project was 500 crores, so I formed a committee, got rid of a lot of contractors who were uh, very poor uh, quality of execution because saying that they should get at least 60% weightage by the committee to be uh, eligible to, for their financial bid to be opened and did that. But but it is a challenge. It is a big challenge. I, in my own contract, uh, one small contract of eight crores, I was not paying attention as I, because the big one I was paying attention. See, we'll do its own process. The guy quotes minus 30%. That eight crores contracts gave me more sleepless nights than the 600, 500 plus crore contract that uh, my, uh, that uh, our uh, uh, Kalpataru team did. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll stop and, now. I think yeah. most of the yeah, most of yeah, the go ahead, go ahead. yeah go ahead. Uh, questions have been taken care. I think now I hand over to the organizer. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Rajiv Ranjan, for uh, moderating today's discussion. And Professor Satyanarayana today was absolutely fascinating. I didn't think that I would personally feel so involved in, in the talk, but the way you told the story was so interesting and engaging that uh, it certainly kept me uh, uh, completely engaged with the, with the discussion. I, th I thought that today there were, while it for the, the presentation itself focused on physical aspect of setting up uh, the campus, <clears throat> I thought there were many takeaways that are relevant not just for an academic campus, but also to all kinds of construction. Uh, so, uh, and you know, whether that's, and that's a company that is setting up shop or given the number of campuses, whether residential or, or uh, business that we see being set up all over our cities. I think there's a lot that can be learned from uh, your experience. And I, th I just made a few uh, note of a few points. Uh, the first being the importance of physical activity and connectivity for those who are going to be visiting and working on the campus on a regular basis. The importance of cultural fit, and this uh, comes whether you have uh, uh, you know, multiple organizations that are, are working together, or campuses that are close by and so on. The whole issue of environmental friendliness, and we all talk about it all the time, and uh, it actually starts very early and, and continues through the, through the whole uh, process of setting up and beyond. Uh, the first point that you made was about an ecology study that really identified everything about the area and looking at how to preserve as much as possible of that. 
And working a design around the natural ecosystem, whether it's flora, fauna, waterways. In fact, if we did something like that in Bangalore today, we wouldn't have a flooding issue or the radical way that we all curse really. Uh, the issue of having multiple architects so that you know you you're spreading uh, work around to people who are specialized in certain areas, getting the right project team and good contractors, but more importantly, specialists wherever uh, they are required. Uh, many technologies, and you talked about fair face buildings with no plaster and paint, precision work, and uh, you know the gypsum panels for walls and floors. Polished concrete floors, the high volume, low speed fans, 48 DC, 48 volt DC fittings, which allow for uh, the large capacity of solar uh, generation that the campus would have and actually being able to put it to use in a good, good manner. The design of buildings based on functionality, such as where you have lab requirements, you put them together and so on. So it's it's. I think what you walked us today was right from the, the point where you're thinking and conceiving of the project all the way through when it's operational. There are many aspects that need to be kept in mind on an ongoing basis. You, you started by talking to us about the history of IIT Tirupati and, and the various uh, third generation IITs. And you, you talked about the thrust area of IIT Tirupati uh, with the industry collaborations that you talked about, the academic collaborations that you talked about. And if you re recall, this was again, the whole collaboration idea of collaboration was so big in our minds when during our uh, launch uh, discussions and uh, you, you brought that up, you br brought all of that to life in, in the way IIT Tirupati has been set up. Um, you, you talked about this being an institution of national importance with global outlook and local um, relevance. I think with all that has happened, everything that has been put in place, IIT Tirupati cannot but be an institute that we'll all continue to be proud of uh, in, in the years to come. So thank you so much for this uh, presentation today. And to our audience, we've had a lot of questions. Thank you so much for the interaction and for bringing in a wide variety of questions. It really enriches the conversation when you do that. Uh, and of course, we will have this presentation up on our YouTube channel come uh, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, look forward to having all of you join us on our next webinar. And uh, thank you once again, both uh, to Professor Rajiv Ranjan and to Professor Satyanarayana. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.